Well, so hi everyone. Welcome to the first of the session uh, on ACL mentorship. Uh, today's session will be on the topic of sharing the learnings from this uh, conference and then also identifying promising research directions. Uh, we could have different formats, but we just come to, came to this room and set up today a panel. Uh, we didn't expect this. Um, so we, we could probably like each of us could highlight a few things and I like, uh, maybe the first 20 minutes will be most of us speaking, or uh, we could also be more engaging in the latter half of the uh, mentorship. I should work for that, but yeah, that's just when you can go straight to that more. Yeah, I'll like, go straight to question answering. <laughs> but, yeah, we, when we did it in ACL, like there was yeah. not enough time left for questions. Yes, that's true. But, but up to you. Okay. Um, then, given this, we'll do a quick round of intro among the panelists. Uh, and then uh, we can collect questions from the audience. So I guess we can start. Um, hi, everyone. Um, it's my pleasure to be here today. My name is Yun Tian, and uh, I just graduated from a TV program in May this year. And now I'm a postdoc at AI2 working with Professor Yun Choi. And upcoming. Oh, and uh, next fall, I will join the University of Waterloo to start my own. Yeah, so you can join our previous mentorship sessions, and then we were joking that he has the most interesting career stage now, just finishing PhD, now doing postdoc, and will be assistant professor next year. Um, so I'm Jijing Jing. I'm uh, finishing my PhD now at Max Planck Institute at ETH. I work on causal NLP. Hi, my name is Andrea Vlakos. I'm part of the University of Cambridge. And yeah, I'm very happy to be doing mentoring sessions. Thanks to all the team for organizing this one. Hi, everyone. I'm Mohit from UNC. Uh, I'm a professor there. I uh, work on multimodal and sustainability uh, development generation and efficiency. And I'm Radha Mitancha, professor at the University of Michigan. I'm working on computational social science or some other model processing. And intersection with other disciplines like healthcare, for instance, um, environment, more recently. So nice to be here. Yes, yes. Uh, so we'll do a random sampling for the audience too. Uh, let us know who you are. You can just do name, affiliation, topic. Uh, any volunteers? Otherwise, I'll run a random number generator. <laughs> yes. <laughs> So, hello, I'm uh, Roman Rene. I'm uh, currently a uh, second year PhD student. I'm working from uh, France at the EBT NRS. And I'm working on uh, crisis management, specifically on the data, currently on data quantification and multimodality. Do you have any questions that you brought to the uh, session? Uh, for us. Uh, no, I was really curious to know what. Uh, uh, we wanted to discuss about uh, what we learn and uh, just what's in the title, what could uh, we explore, what we could know from the conference that we could bring back to to our lab. Just a survey question for the subject that, for the topic that you do, crisis uh, related things, are you, like, do you feel the big impact of large language models or it's a niche area that's not that effective? Um, actually, uh, we start to use uh, LLM uh, recently. Uh, first results were not uh, encouraging in this case, but uh, it's probably the time to learn how to use it and uh, something like that. But uh, we, in, actually, the problem was more in uh, the data sets, so that's small data sets, so we started to focus more on this problem. Uh, instead of uh, working with uh, LLM, but uh, we think it would be really useful because uh, LLM could be a really powerful tool. Great, awesome. Thanks for sharing. Uh, pass your microphone to another person. Um, hello, my name is Xiao. Uh, I'm from Columbia University in the city of New York. I'm a first year PhD student. And um, I'm 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 working on um, RLs like and and as applications to NLP systems with kind of the mind that perhaps we can train some um, 
some agent without using so much supervision of like a huge humongous uh, text data, um, something like that, um, kind of inspired by how chess people are doing you know, their, their stuff without too much supervision. I feel like maybe um, we can get away with without using so much um, intensive compute and training. And um, recently I've been um, going around uh, checking out of other works. I think you know, there are many, especially today, there are many works um, analyzing and evaluating large language models performance on many different tasks and found many interesting, I guess, unexpected behavior of large language models, which kind of um, makes me question like how, like how far can we um, go with large language models in, I guess, mounting applications like how, how I feel like you know many applications are like um, using large language model as a component as this, and they're working on some I guess like plugins or future like adapters to 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 fix that a little bit uh, to for downstream performance. Like how far can we go in that direction, and how far should, uh, like when should we kind of um, stop um, doing that and then actually go back to fix the large language models uh, or focus on that. Um, Great question, very relevant. Uh, any thoughts from the panel? I think just within the uh, context of this conference, um, I see there is a lot about language models in terms of consuming content and all that, which is interesting. Uh, but I also see the other kind of work um, which will be relevant to this question. So maybe some sort of work today and tomorrow. Um, seems like um, cross-cultural evaluation, like how much knowledge there is about different cultures. That's something that I'm personally interested in and I'm paying attention to. And I see there is some interesting work on that. Um, there is um, also some work on low resource languages and again, thinking from the perspective of that and again with respect to language models, like what's the limitation and where there is a lot of work to do for us. Um, and I see some interesting work there also to be presented. Um, so I think there is a lot. Maybe if you just look at the titles walking around both assumptions superficially, you will mostly notice like language model this and that. So it's more about really the large part of them. Um, but then there is other work which maybe will take more scrolling through the papers in the program and looking session X and finding that one paper that really talks about these other aspects that you brought up. Um, so those papers are here too, and I think will be something to look forward for the remaining of the of the conference. Low resource, I would say cross cultural multimodality also brings interesting perspective where there is still a lot of um, there are a lot of limitations from that language models. Yeah, so and uh, so I agree with what Radha said, and then to add, uh, I would also encourage you to look at uh, human in the loop aspect here, right? So LLM should not be treated as an end to end sort of God model that they do everything for us and uh, right to be perfect. I think the goal should be to right not replace things but assist things. So uh, there's a lot of work on trying to, uh, so personally, for example, uh, I've seen uh, a lot of work on trying to have language models as planners. And programmers, uh, and we perceive some of that too. But the idea is that uh, once it has an initial plan or program, right, even for things like image or video generation, uh, you can actually then intervene and change it both for personalization and for error, error correction. Right, you can see what the limitations are. But if you're doing it through interpretable planning and programming, then you actually have a handle over the LLM's outputs and can actually use it both to understand its errors and improve it, but also for a downstream end user they can intervene and change the plan to their liking because it's more understandable and then regenerate the final output. So, so there's multiple such aspects uh, that can make LLMs uh, seem more useful because then you're using them for the right kind of thing. Yeah, um, yeah. so one thing that I'd like to highlight which is actually something that's been going on for a while as we did better language work, but now we're with larger sizes and better performance, I think if you can, kind of taking more support another step further you can rethink of tasks that have some kind of a structural prediction we would call them 10 years ago and you think them in the you frame that the structure in natural language then you can use a language model 
right? So, and that can be very exciting. Uh, language model then can become cross -linked. You can train something for English and, and to French or something like that. So there are many opportunities in that. Perhaps I can, you know, the arrow of and you know, there's like sometimes, you know, I just can be, can be worried about why am I doing this or should I all, should we all be doing LLMs? Maybe, I mean, some people should be doing it, right? Uh, but there's a lot of other things you can do thanks to that. And um, you know, another line of research that I think uh, is um, quite uh, prominent in this conference is ambiguity. A lot of uh, our evaluations, our models are essentially trained on a single correct output, and often uh, our data is constructed is also driven by the desire to have high interactivity of human for a good reason, right? I'm not suggesting we should uh, construct noisy, poorly annotated data sets. That's not what I'm saying. But we should also at the same time appreciate that sometimes there's good reasons to disagree. That's for humans. And then we should actually develop models that are able to do justice to that. Right? So careful though, I don't want to see bad data sets. That's what I'm saying. Uh, also, before I answer this question, I want to see uh, the relevance of this question for the audience. Like, how many of us are considering like uh, this type of thing? Like, we want to see the limits of LM as your main research direction. Uh, so we have this as choice A, and then choice B is like, given the current LM, how can we use them creatively for different topics? And maybe choice C are other. So how many of us want to improve the LMs? And like that's why this question come from. Okay, cool. Uh, good number of hands. And how many of us are thinking about creative ways to use them as they are now? Oh, wow, a lot. Great, awesome. And then for people who haven't raised their hands, uh, tell us some keywords. Yeah. Well, I guess the alternative, if you consider only like text only language models, is to go towards like multi modal language models, maybe. Again, process like multi modality use that and operate in the real world in a more concrete way. So, totally. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, any other thoughts? Any other topics that people care about? Yes. Uh, maybe pass the. Uh, So all the hallucination stuff that's been happening around, there's this family of work of constrained decoding, where in the decoding process, you sort of uh, ensure that the model spits out the valid tokens according to whatever use case you have. And that's like, people haven't really explored it as much, but especially in enterprise use cases, it's something that uh, a lot of folks are really interested in. Great, thank you very much for the key points. Keep the microphone for us for our next question. I think that actually relates maybe also to Andrea's direction, fact checking, making things more uh, grounded in what's real. Um, yeah, just some quick thoughts. Also on the uh, choice B, where most of us raise our hands like for innovative ways to connect the current usage of LM to more creative applications. Uh, I think at least like what Radha and I were, are working on is try to promote NLP for positive impact. So we try to uh, sort of do NLP plus X, where X could be things like healthcare, education, uh, gender, uh, gender balance, and then a bunch of other issues. Uh, and we do, uh, we will have next EMLP uh, a whole day of workshop on that, where we have panels, where, uh, each of these panels, let's say education panel, will have some domain specific experts and an NLP person. They can converse to each other uh, to help each other identify important research directions. Uh, but in general, I feel like this is now, if you're interested in interdisciplinary uh, research, this is now the time to uh, do your plus X thing. Yeah. And comment on any other yeah, I, I think I have like a really short comment. So um, um, I want to point you to a paper from that. And I think you are also on the paper, right? Um, kind of what kind of problems we could work on in the age of large language models. And in that paper, 
uh, you mentioned a lot of uh, interesting directions, which uh, include both the limitations of running tools and also what kind of new applications can arise because now everything is set to work. So I cannot exactly remember the name of the paper. Perspective is something. Yeah, a PhD's perspective on research in the era of large language models. Uh, or go to Radha's Twitter to see her pink tweet. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah. Uh, we can touch more uh, grounded questions. I also want to add a little bit of comment to choice A. Uh, then we can open question to uh, people and you can raise your hand, bring your question forward. So the question A is about uh, including large language models. Uh, I'm just like anecdotally playing around with LMs a lot and ChatGPT. I feel like they do have some capability limits that, as I feel, for example, for very complicated coding de debugging, they cannot really decode if you have a long context of code or uh, sometimes I have problems with over overleaf and they don't have much training data of how to debug a lesson. And then they can never answer my question correctly. Um, I also see that a lot of companies actually not to is like they already use up all the data they have, so they have to rely on RL to make it more advanced. But I do question the fundamental limits of yeah how complicated let's say causal reasoning, numerical reasoning, um, coding related reasoning, or many other things they can do. Great. Uh, we can open to more questions. Uh, yes. Uh, so we'll get to the last microphone holder to, uh, so there's a question in the middle. Thank you. So we'll do this more distributed passing of microphones. Hi, I'm Tim. Um, I'm second year PhD at the University of Maryland College Park, and I work on legal aid for defenders for NLP and machine learning. My question is, probably about the topic of fairness, bias. Um, so most of the theoretical foundation in AI fairness is grounded in the machine learning literature, right? So I'm curious, what is your take on some of the, um, some of the interesting insight from ML fairness that NLP fairness sort of can learn from and develop further upon? And secondly, what is some of the sort of distinctive fairness question that only like applicable to NLP moving forward rather than, you know, from NL. Yes. Great question. I can start um, humans and turn NLP. <laughs> Just going back again to the title of this session, like what are we learning from this conference and what else can we learn? Um, I have an actual way to have seen um, the poster um, earlier today. I cannot tell you the authors, but I can tell you the title. It was with one very good bias. So I think that's a very NLP perspective on fairness. Um, the finding the way I gather from the poster is that um, if you do, for instance, pre-training with multiple languages, you do not necessarily fix the bias, but no, fine-tuning would not fix the bias, pre-training would tell. Um, and so that's something, for instance, to look at, like what kind of bias you see in different languages and whether you can leverage these differences to maybe fix the bias. Um, you could even consider different cultures, which is really my interest. So we've done similar work on looking at English, but in different cultures, and seeing that there is different bias. Um, and then obviously also trying to come up with constructive ways to address the bias that we observe. So one angle is to find the limitations, the other to actually learn from that. And, in that work that I seen earlier today, it's a paper to look for like what kind of bias would be a field. Um, how can we fix that by learning from different languages, from different cultures? Um, I think that's that's very, very interesting. I know. Another thing to add is that um, what we can learn from well is one thing that I thought in the middle happened earlier is that to quantify fairness and uh, as far as I'm aware there are different notions of fairness that you cannot optimize all of them at the same time. Some of them are conflicting at the, at the end of it have not so far. And I think so for me it's important to be able to quantify what we are looking for. Because once you have a quantified measure then you can say right I'm optimizing that I can evaluate what I'm doing. I think often we kind of have you know 
again, uh, analysis, IT analysis, uh, uh, that I think is more to quantify so that we can actually make progress, measurable progress. And it's also like, is that quantification? Um, so is that quantification universal? It just think it's also very interesting, right? So in terms of bias, we talk about, say, career, family, right? And then you say that's a gender bias. But is that really for everyone? Maybe that's very Western. Maybe in other cultures, it's really not about career and family. Maybe it's other angles that we don't even measure. And so I think at some point, which is up to all of us here, is to think constructively and question every single part, like even the evaluations, is that the universal? Maybe we can question that as well. Um, and that is something that we can learn a lot from the language, since that was your question. Yeah, thank you. And also, uh, when I talk to a lot of people in this conference, uh, I also noticed that um, many people are working on alignment these days. So I think once we have established a quantitative way of uh, measuring values, bias, then maybe the next kind of research question is how to uh, align models with our values. Yeah, uh, I really like all the points that Rana and Jeff and Intia mentioned. Uh, one other thing I want to add, learning from experience, my experience doing a statistical causal inference versus NLP-based causal inference. So uh, an important thing is that out of NLP, the other domains usually have a structured data. So it give, they give you all the variables for you to discuss what it's biased towards. But in NLP, we incorporate everything. So maybe there are some hidden things that's happening in the society, but not really captured by the surveys or uh, structured data. But then NLP can help finding that out. Um, yeah, also, just analogously, uh, for example, if people want to predict suicide, sometimes the data is not in clinical record or whatever thing, but the person staying close to the patient actually can detect something. I wonder if that thing could be encoded in text data only. Yeah. Uh, any new questions? Uh, seize this chance and uh, maximize, yeah. What you want to hear about? Yes, we had a. Uh, uh, okay, we'll first give the. I give it to the uh, most right person, and then we'll pass it back to the Hi. middle. So I'm Farah, professor in Toulouse University, and also researcher in great uh, scenarios that create in Singapore. Uh, so my, since I'm here, I'm seeing LMs everywhere, like everybody noticed, and my worry is that research in NLP will be engineer driven. And uh, losing human, we, are, we do not know where humans are. And this is my real worry. And when I saw yesterday a talk on um, the place of interdisciplinarity on NLP, in NLP paper recently, so we saw a real drop in the number of interdisciplinary citations in NLP papers to other disciplines like linguistics, psychology, and so on, which means that people are only looking for the performance what the uh, big performance of elements are actually given to us and losing for whom these tools are, um, are made for, who will use them, who are the users. And uh, yeah, so this is completely aligned uh, with uh, what you said about the, uh, the social impact of uh, our research. So yeah, I'm a bit worried. I don't want to break my streak <laughs> I think it's something that, I mean, I got worried so many times, and I started in NLP in 97, so it's been a while, and I got worried, like, similar ways when we saw, like, what is statistical methods, right? And every single paper was, part of speech tagging using decision trees. Next, part of speech tagging using templates, <laughs> and you say, okay, I mean, that's all you could publish. And then obviously people lost excitement in that, right? So then you got back and language surface again. Now, say, for the past 10 years was, you will not work this, you will not work that, and no language. And that it sunk back. So the way I envision it is, the only thing that people get really excited. Now, now it's language markets, right? And everything, like if you walk in the Boston session, every single time you listen. 
I don't know, whatever, it's like prompts and fine tuning and large language model. That's all you can see if you just zoom over tight. And that eventually it becomes more like it sinks in and it will become something. It's not going to go away. It's like supervised machine learning it didn't go anywhere, right? It's still with us. The same neural network, they didn't go anywhere. They are still with us, but it's not what people are excited about. So they won't be in the titles. They will kind of sink and language will surface again. So it goes in waves. Like I felt worried so many times, but over time I realized it goes like that. So we are now on the peak of, or maybe I don't know, mm -hmm. but it will eventually, I mean, language will eventually resurface. Uh, but it's interesting to observe, and I think it's right to be worried and just, I guess, keep your interest in language. If you are in a position to encourage others, I guess, try to encourage people who are really curious about language as opposed to seeing this as a place to just improve accuracy and get sort of, I don't know. Yeah, because most of our students are only looking into tables and numbers. <laughs> <laughs> and even if we have plus 0 0.01, we are very happy <laughs> without ex um, understanding why or trying to understand why. So I think that it's good for the young generation to understand that we are doing language, not numbers. <laughs> yeah, thank you. I think many of us will have thoughts on this question. So really nice question. Yeah, I think, uh, and uh, I'll keep it short since you know, we have like time left. But, but yeah, so exactly what Radha said, right? I think it comes in waves, but also, uh, first of all, there are many uh, papers here that are looking at what language models, like question A, right? Things that they're not good at and why are they good at something and let's analyze it and are they uh, good by accident or by taking shortcuts. So luckily our community works a lot on this stuff. Uh, and I think all of us here do, uh, right? So let's not take anything at face value. I mean, there's a lot of uh, very good work on evaluation, uh, shortcuts, counterfactuality, causality. Uh, but coming back to the point of uh, interdisciplinary uh, citation, yes, I think it's a matter of time. Uh, maybe also in the sense that we are making LLMs be useful first, right? And then once they reach that stage, uh, then right, it's more responsible to be using them for uh, Sort of more uh, critical downstream areas, but uh, I mean, all of us uh, and many people in this room, I'm sure, are having a lot of meetings and conversations and collaborations. Uh, I personally have a uh, lot of uh, work going on with education experts through an NSF Institute on Education. Uh, we are doing things like LLMs to generate diagrams, uh, uh, classroom uh, and video analysis, summarization, right? But we are doing it at user study level because LLMs are still not good enough to be useful in real classrooms for now. So I think that wave will come, uh, right? We're also working with psychologists. Uh, we're also working with philosophers. So I think all of us uh, are like hopefully being right, probably waiting for LLMs to become actually useful. So I think you see a lot of these papers trying to make them maybe more useful and also trying to critically uh, analyze them. And then we'll have hopefully another wave <laughs> of uh, downstream applications uh, be a bigger part of the conference. Uh, kind of adding to this, I want to say that well, interdisciplinarity, it's not just a matter of who we cite in the paper we publish here. Many of us publish in other conferences that are not NLP conferences, nor or machine learning for that, or you know, we are not professional offers necessarily. And uh, so I think you can measure it differently. I can think of like maybe now, as a field, we have produced something that's actually useful to others. So that's why they take it and they actually. So they, they actually work kind of like influences and is used as well. So that then it's a choice of our community what we want in this conference not here. That's the, the problem serves all the way down to the reviewer that decides and what makes them here. Because that's a bias, right? And uh, so for me, I work a lot with uh, psychologists, for example. And uh, you know, I've, I found it difficult to actually some part of those relevant to this community. It's okay, like you know, it's not a problem per se. But it's a choice. Like I think, uh, you know, it's a choice of the community where it wants to go. And uh, returning to the point of tables, I should say, the hunt for the improvements of the tables is not just our problem. Everybody, you know, I, I argued earlier about quantifying, you know, the, our success in fairness. Say, well, that, there you have a table. Well, that's a good thing. You can measure things. That also means that yes, people, there's another leaderboard, maybe the fairness leaderboard, and that's. You know, yes, if you're saying that 0.1% improvement, maybe that's not what you should be doing either if it's the fairness. So, you know, everything will be balanced, right?
thanks a lot for all the insights. Uh, I want to ask one important question, though, uh, to the panelists. Uh, so uh, given this uh, current dynamics, what do we now identify as uh, some key talents that you usually look on students or collaborators? Um, and then uh, also a combined question will be, we especially designed this first of a data session in the middle of the conference so that we can collect some statistics of how the conference goes. But we also really want to have some takeaway messages for the people who are attending now. So also another question for the panelists would be, for the rest of one and a half days, what would be good for junior students or people yeah, wanting to learn a lot to focus on? Uh, or skip certain questions, focus on more uh, insights on certain things. Sorry, what was the first part? Uh, the first part is like uh, when you look at students or admit students, what the panel team look at, um, or collaborators, when you form collaboration, uh, what information gain would be very helpful. I have access to so to me, I don't think anything changed with two large language models. I've always looked in students for that um, constructive problem-solving attitude, which has been always the same, so I didn't change now. I don't look necessarily for other skills, so as long as a person shows that, um, they won't be able to find interesting problems to address. They won't be able to find interesting solutions, so that, again, didn't change. Um, and in terms of what to do for the rest of the conference, again, it never changed, I think, in, in my world. I think meeting other people and striking interesting conversations with people you don't know, I think that you learn the most that way. I mean, obviously, it's also work. I make some questions. The other people mention other interesting things they've noticed here. So looking for that kind of work, I think there'll be something to learn. But to me, really, conferences about, are about events like this and the coffee breaks and the parties and social events where you really get to meet people. So I think that's been a concern. Large language models or not, just go and network and meet some interesting people. And um, that will be what I would say. You want to do a first one? Sure. Okay, thanks. Your list six, very short. <laughs> yeah, so, um, yeah, I also echo what Vera said because I know where do we learn to do this. So, when I first attended conferences, I kind of like went to all these kind of talks and I tried to learn something from them. But now I realize that we can just kind of, kind of go to the, the like the uh, underline and watch the videos <laughs> or even kind of like record the posters. So, I think it most, makes more sense to kind of use this time to kind of actually talk to people. Because for example, when you see a poster, is so the work is done like probably over half a year ago, and it's pretty outdated given kind of how fast uh, the pace of uh, research is today. But if you talk to the people who are doing the research, you can ask them what their thoughts on what the kind of math problem they are working on. And I think you can learn much more uh, compared to just uh, reading what's being published and also, in terms of um, evaluating um, kind of student candidates, because now I'm kind of trying to um, kind of evaluate students who apply to a PhD program. So what I look at the most is kind of how passionate people are about their own work. The level if you kind of talk to someone and they are not kind of that passionate about even their own work, like you lose the interest, you feel kind of it's very boring. And I think to me, kind of passion is. Uh, the thing that I care about most. Uh, yeah, so for the first question, uh, yes, I, I, I agree with both uh, the previous panelists. Uh, I think LLM shouldn't change anything, right? I mean, that's something else will come up in two years. Uh, and I mean, they will always, I think, uh, I think I probably look for a couple of things. One is uh, related to passion, but uh, also someone who likes to read a lot of papers and sort of be in touch with what's both good and bad in the current community, right? Uh, and when I say bad in the current community, that connects to my second aspect of creativity. I think the student should be uh, interested in thinking a little bit out of the box instead of just what the rest of the world is doing or only thinking incrementally. Uh, so that's, and that's not necessarily what I look for, but also what I try to encourage when they join the group because they can't really be ready with everything already, right? 
these are the couple of things I encourage. Uh, being uh, up to date and like, like being uh, sort of uh, in touch with what's going on in the community and then being able to also uh, sort of bifurcate a bit about what's interesting versus, uh, and versus not really creative uh, and trying to go a little bit on their own path as opposed to just following the herd. Uh, and then the second part, uh, sorry, what, I'm just getting like, what's the second part? <laughs> Uh, the second part is like suggestion for the. Oh, right, yeah. So, same, yeah. Uh, very similar uh, lead to what uh, was said. I think uh, the, the, the pace of the community, uh, the papers that you'll uh, like, yeah, I mean, talk to the people, not, like, not don't get stuck on the papers. Uh, that's why I like poster sessions a lot. And that's why most other communities focus almost only on posters as opposed to uh, this whole oral versus poster thing. Is because then you can actually talk to the people at the posters and you can just forget the poster in like five minutes, uh, right? Because you either read it or they've sort of gotten bored of saying the same thing, which is six months old. But you can actually have, an, uh, have a conversation about what they're thinking next, right? What are they doing now? Where do they think the field is going? So I think getting a lot of uh, insights from people on where, where they think the field is going and should be going is probably the best thing you can collect at a conference. Uh, and the, uh, the equally best thing is your network and friends forever, right? That you make from the conference. Uh, right, I mean, uh, all of us have like very, very old. Oh, yeah, oh, yeah, like 12, 15 years ago, we met at this conference and we had that drink and like we went to this uh, tourism spot. So, I would I would focus on the people, uh, not the paper, but papers are outdated as you can say. So, in terms of what I'm looking for in the perspective of students, uh, I think uh, creativity, constructive uh, problem solving, uh, being aware of the literature. Uh, these are all things that I'm looking for. So I'll focus on the second part, which is about what to do at the conference. And one of the things that I think has become clear is that, uh, the, well, perhaps post-COVID, the talk versus poster is a different conversation than it was before COVID. But uh, what I would say in terms of generally, depending on whether it's a talk or a poster, I, I suggest the following approach. Go deep, like the, you select some pictures you want to see and go there, be it a call talk or a poster. And then, sit around till the end of the session, if it's an oral session, see some talks that maybe you hadn't thought of, of, of attending. So often some serendipity will happen, some idea that you hadn't clicked on the title happens there. You know, you could check your emails like everybody else does, but keep an eye out right? <laughs> Same with the post session, which actually happens in the post session very nicely. You're working to the post you want to see. Good. Go and see that poster. Also those, keep an eye out on the way. You might see something that you haven't thought of checking. Yeah, these comments are so loud, right? You know, that it's impossible to really, I think, go through the program and really find everything, everything that should you should attend. And uh, that was true actually even 20 years ago, and it's even more true today. So I suggest so this kind of approach like, yeah, pick some things and then give some time for random exploration around them. And uh, I think you'll find it beneficial and the people. And uh, think out of the box, see what other things where the food is going. Also, depending on the, okay, I, the way I thought about this is that initially I would go to a conference and I would study really very few papers. So I would learn very few things because I couldn't understand most of them going around. As I became more experienced and more familiar with the literature, I was like, oh, I have to attend everything because I, you know, I was at the stage where most papers were kind of accessible. To me. And then I kind of scaled back there. <laughs> So, you know, think about that, you know, don't, don't be worried, like, you know, it's like, it's also part of essentially the waves, that actually that's your personal wave, you're going up and down, right, in terms of, you know, how you engage you are with the literature, because you know, they do say, oh, I've seen it all, no, I didn't go, maybe, right, I say, you know, maybe, you know, uh, you know, so bear that in mind how you're going through the, 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 this conference uh, the last day, but maybe the future conference too. Thank you so much for the very good sharing. I had some uh, quick little points. I like the summary of uh, paper with uh, paper and people, the two P principle. Um, and in addition, uh, I also really like uh, Richard Hammond's uh, talk on you and your research. So basically, when we're looking at the posters or the orals, one very effective way I think is to chat with the author and understand two questions. Where does the research question come from? What is the methodology they use, whatever agnostic to the research question they investigate? So basically, um, one of the paper, I also saw the title, you are what you repeatedly do. So first, after choosing a research question, which is yeah, a, a more um, 
uh, things that come with insights and experience. But after doing the, the question, the way you solve it is sort of what you repeated do across uh, every project. So you can learn from how others solve their problems and then collect a nice set of toolboxes. And then the other thing is to identify good research questions. That's why you come to this uh, person of data or chat with multiple people. I also learned a lot by uh, scanning through the entire ACL anthology on the other one um, on certain topic. Uh, so once you see a hundred examples, you sort of have curate a more data-driven feeling of what is interesting research. Great. Uh, with this, I know that our keynote session is happening. And thanks, everyone, for joining. Thank you.